Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. I've been wanting to read the Sermon on the Mount for several days now, and uh, I decided I was going to go ahead and read it and make a video. The reason being that a lot of the messages have mentioned staying in the Word. How You know, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' teachings on how to live. How to live right. So you may have read it so many times, you know, you're like, oh, I'm good with that. I know all that and go on to something else. That's fine. But a lot of people might want a little refresher course. How we're supposed to live in these end days, <laughs> we all know. But um, I want to read it. So why not just go ahead and record it for anybody that might like to hear it too. All right. Okay, let's get started. This is in Matthew, starts in chapter 5, verse 1. And I use the NASB because I like that it capitalizes the pronoun he and whom. And I know it's talking about God and not someone else. And sometimes that matters. All right. And they like to give a title to each section. And this first section is called The Sermon on the Mount, The Beatitudes. And I'd like some, some of y'all's opinions on a couple of these things. So feel free to leave your comments. When Jesus saw the crowds, this is verse 1. If you'd like to get your Bible and join me, that would be real good. It'd be like a Bible study for you. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and the footnote says, or hill, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, the footnote for blessed means fortunate or prosperous and so through v verse 11 okay so that's i guess through the beatitudes that's what it means fortunate or prosperous are hmm blessed are the poor in spirit now, we know that doesn't mean poor in money. It means those who are not spiritually arrogant. Now, that was the one I had a little question about. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I have probably read this, I don't know, a couple dozen times, maybe, maybe more. And I always thought the poor in spirit sounded to me like someone who needed a little more of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what it means. Clearly, it means they're not spiritually arrogant according to this. Um, the people who did Blue Letter Bible. Jasper, what are you doing? What are you doing? Come over here where I can see you. Will you? Will you come over here where I can see you? My goodness. I don't know what he was doing. Scratching at something under the bed. Don't get under the bed. Yeah, you're such... It's like having a toddler around. Yeah, you are. Okay, now let me do this. Okay, no, don't mess with that. Let me put it over here. He needs paper, too. All right. Well, don't look at me like that. It's the truth. All right. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. And the footnote is humble or meek for the word gentle. Blessed are the humble or meek. For they shall inherit the earth. We all should be humble and meek. 
But sometimes I think the word meek, I guess it doesn't mean mousy. <laughs> like, the Lord wants you to speak up and say things for him. Because if we don't acknowledge him to others, he won't acknowledge us to the Father. So we have to, you have to have, you have to take everything into context. And this is one of those examples. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That's my favorite one. I hunger and thirst for righteousness, and I shall be satisfied. Jasper, don't chew the chair. Thank you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, who are the pure in heart? Your heart is pure. I think of when, before you're born again, spiritually speaking, your heart is at least part black, stained, full of sins. Maybe some people only have a little bit. Maybe some people have a lot. Maybe their whole heart is black. Okay. We need to let God circumcise our hearts. That's in the scriptures. What happens when a baby gets circumcised? They take a little scalpel and they cut away that little bit of skin that is not needed and basically accumulates dirt. If Okay, without getting too graphic, we need to let God circumcise our hearts. Cut away the dross, the impure parts. And it takes time. Now, some people can get born again. Bam! They quit smoking. They quit cussing. They start going to church. They get into their Bible. They, they stop everything, you know? And... At least for a while, they're so on fire for the Lord. They start telling all their friends. They tell their co-workers. They do everything right. You know, basically. And some people stay that way. But that's not... The, that's the exception rather than the rule. Most of us give up the big stuff. But we have to work at the smaller stuff. You you know, I, I take my ex-husband, the third one. He stopped cussing and using bad language just like that. And he didn't use it a lot, but he did enough that it was, you know, I'd have to say something or just ugh, cringe, you know, because I didn't want to harp. What are you doing? He must be bored. Don't you have enough toys, baby? Go get your toys. Go get your toys. Go get your golf balls. Yeah, he's got golf balls he loves to play with. Go get your golf balls. Go get your golf balls. Yeah, I'll help you. I'll throw them down there for you. And you can go get them. Yeah, you have to go get them. All right, let me finish. <laughs> Okay, so blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's all get rid of our sins and be pure in heart. Okay, and I know we all mess up every day. I do. Either it's complaining or it's maybe a thought of doubt, uh, which a lot of times I'd say, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Get out of here. I say that even though I know it's a demon. Or I'll rebuke you, impure, lying spirit. Get out of here and stop trying to put lies in my head. 
Don't accept any lies from the enemy, doubt, and unbelief. That grieves the Lord, okay? So then you say, I'm sorry, Lord, I bought into that. Or, I'm sorry that I was thinking of that, you know, whatever. It may be just a little bit of sin, but if you think it grieved the Lord, just ask Him to forgive you. It's not a real big deal. Now, if you go out and you do something really big, you know, you just ask. You're still forgiven. Sin is sin. But the big stuff you plan, you, you, oh, you have to learn to cut that, nip that in the bud and don't, don't do it. All right, let me move on. Because that happens to Christians. It can happen because Satan is going around like a lion, roaring like a go I can't think how it's worded. Satan roars about like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. He wants us, not the lost people. Of course, he does whatever he can to keep them from wanting to hear anything we tell them. Alright, blessed are those who have been persecuted. For the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now isn't that interesting that he said, In the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now it doesn't mean he's calling everybody who reads this a prophet. But it's usually those who are hearing from the Lord getting dreams and visions that are the most persecuted, but also those who just spread the gospel, try to convert their friends or relatives and tell them, hey, we're in the end days, you, you know, don't take the mark of the beast, and they tell them they're crazy, and how do you know all that? I mean, how do you know that is the mark of the beast? Try telling them about the COVID vaccine and the hydrogel tattoo that comes with it. I hope they listen. And even if they make fun of you, they got it in the back of their mind. So that when it comes and they actually see it, we pray they won't take it. And that's why part of us that are ready go up. We get our armor, our instructions, we come back to help all these people say no to the mark. They will have to go through the seals, some tribulation. Uh, tr they will have to learn to trust God. And we will also be able to do the things that Jesus did and greater than these things he said we shall do. And we will help them. Keep that in mind. Let's concentrate on that instead of what they're going to have to go through. We're going to be there to help. You see? So that's what I came to the conclusion of. I could not worry about the hardships they would go through because the Lord is sending us back to help them. Alright, this part is called Disciples and the World. Matthew 5.13 You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? Now that's a good question. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out. Hey! You need
need that mat. Stop chewing it up. He has a stool. I had bought it for Buddy so he could get up and down off his bed. And then I realized he needed his own bed down on the ground. Well, anyway, I bought this stool. And I'm using it for Jasper so he can get up on my bed. But it keeps sliding all over. So I put this half a circle kitchen mat that my friend had given me when I moved in here under the mat. And it works great to hold the stool down. And he's... He's destroying it. He's a puppy, I know. But he's frustrating. Leave that mat alone and don't chew it up. Come over here and chew your toys. Chew all the toys you want. Come up here and destroy that dragon I keep telling you to. A friend brought some toys that her dog didn't want anymore and one's a dragon. I almost threw it out, but I said, I keep telling him. Chew that thing up and destroy it. All right. So, how can salt be made salty again? He's referring to Christians who were at one time spreading the gospel, living right. By their actions, people could tell they were Christians. Now they no longer are. It's getting dark, isn't it? Oh, what a pretty sky. It's beautiful. Every time I take pictures of that, though, they never come out like that. All right. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. We're not supposed to try to hide the fact that we're a Christian. We're supposed to show the world our light. But getting back to the saltiness, we know that if we backslide and turn from God, for whatever reason, Unless you blaspheme the Holy Spirit or coming up, take the mark of the beast, you can repent. You can repent, get forgiven, and still make it to heaven. But you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, people that know you, your circle of friends may not believe anything you say now because they'll say, oh, you said that before and now, and, and then you turned and you started living like the world and now you want us to believe that. I'll forget about it. I'm, I'm not hearing it. You see, that could be what it means. You, you, you might not have any, you're already, we already don't have much influence in our family or friends because the Bible says a prophet is not without honor except in his own family and with his friends something like that so people outside of your circle of friends and family will be more likely to pay attention to you than those who know you that's the only way I take it. If anybody can give me another explanation, that is fine. Please put it in the comments. All right, so city, we talked about this, uh, city set on a, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket or peck a measure but on the lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven 
It's nice to be anonymous when it comes to giving. Learn, learn, learn of this. Let your light shine before men. Okay. You don't have to think you gotta be anonymous in everything that you do. I understand people might want to give to somebody money or even a big barrel of food and they don't want credit. They don't want anybody to know and they do it in the middle of the night and pray no dogs get into it or whatever and they get the food and they don't know who did it. But this is saying let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Here's one of those verses where the once saved, always saved, talking about we don't have to do any good works. Uh, you, well, it depends on who you're talking to. A lot of, some of them will say, well, we do good works because we love God. Because we do love our brother or sister. We do love people as we love ourselves. Not because we have to. Well, that's true. See, some of them are only partially once saved, always saved. Others have a, it's a mixture. Or is that, that redundant? Anyway, the Lord is telling us to let our light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. This is Jesus talking. Jesus did his good works on the Sabbath or wherever he ran into somebody sick. He didn't whisper, hey, meet me in the cave over on the blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying. He did it in front of everyone so they would know that he had the power to do these things. So that when he said, your sins are forgiven, they were more apt to accept it. He said, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Remember, now some of you may not have heard this, many scholars, even you two people have figured out that Matthew was written to the Jews. Mark was written to the left behind church. And Luke was written for the bride. And those who shall be found, it says Luke 21, 36, pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that are to come upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. I look at that as a bride standing in front of her groom. That's how I take it. Feel free to leave your interpretation. You're standing before the Son of Man. Of course, once everybody gets in heaven, eventually... You will all be standing in front of the Son of Man at some point. All right. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't say they'll go to hell. But keep listening. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great 
in the kingdom of heaven. They had 613 laws they had to keep, not just 10. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's see where I'm at here. 25 minutes. All right, maybe I, I'll finish chapter 5 and then make a part 2. on. It's like three chapters. This section is called Personal Relationships. I need another drink of water. Okay. Oh, just a little side note here. I did get new glasses. This is what I got. That second doctor I went to wrote such an odd prescription that not only did I have to take a picture of it and submit it, they called me. They wanted to make sure those numbers were right. And this is what I ordered online at I buy, I buy direct. Now, the doctors were trying to tell me my left eye could not be helped with glasses. Well, they made sure of it. I should not have told that doctor to the other doctor I went to. It just slipped out. They were probably buddies. If I close my left eye, I can read fine with this glass, with these glasses. If I close my right eye, I cannot. I've written to them asking could I please still return them because I was going to do it Monday and then my heart did its thing. And I, uh, yesterday, the 31st was the last day to return them. So I wrote them yesterday and maybe they'll let me. Anyway, so I did did go to a second eye doctor, and I did get glasses, and I want to show you these old Dollar General glasses that are like 2.0. I can look outside and see perfectly with them, but to read with them, I have to get real close, but I can read with them. Isn't that something? Anyway, back to the scriptures. I think they're in cahoots together. They'd rather have me have surgery. Personal relationships. That's just how I am now. I could be totally wrong. You have heard that the ancients were told. Okay, that's... Moses and that group got the commandments. Moses got them all. The first five books were supposedly written by Moses. Matthew 5.21 says, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder. That's the fifth commandment, if I'm not mistaken. Or sixth. See, I learned them as a Catholic, and they're different. They're one off. There's four and then six. Anyway, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But, verse 22 says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, 
shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and this could mean anybody, your sister, your mother, your best friend, your coworker, anybody. It's saying brother. I'm sure it doesn't mean your sibling. It has to mean, at the very least, your Christian brother. Why don't we do this? I'm going to click tools. And I am going to look up other possible meanings of brother. If you are presenting your offering, let's see, remember that your brother. Okay, Ad Adelphos. It's G80. Adelphos. Masculine noun. All right, and it's brethren, brother, brothers, apostrophe S, brother's way. All right, now the outline of biblical usage is a brother, whether born of the same two parents or only of the same father or mother, two, having the same national ancestor belonging to the same people as in fellow Israelite or countryman three any fellow or man four a fellow believer united to another by the bond of affection that's like brothers and sisters in Christ five an associate in employment or office. Six, brethren in Christ. And under that is A, his brothers by blood. B, all men. C, apostles. D, Christians. As those who are exalted to the same heavenly place. So, can we agree? It pretty much means any fellow or man. All right, go back. Any person. Whoops. I went too far. We're in the third section. All right. Let me X out of that. <clears throat> I love it how you can pull strong concordance right up when you're reading the word. If you want to know what other possible meanings it is or what does, the, what does it mean by brother. All right. So, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. Somebody has something against you. Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. You try. You say, Hey, I am sorry that I did such and such and it caused you grief and whatever, whatever. You try to make amends. If they refuse, it's off your hands. You can't force anybody to forgive you. You just, you've done your part. All right. So you've gone and you tried to make amends. Hopefully you did. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. It doesn't mean you never have to offer another thing to the Lord because they won't forgive you. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him 
or I'm sorry, while you are, yeah, with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. So here it sounds to me like it, you're the you're the guilty party and you're about to go into court with the man who's suing you. It's saying make friends quickly with your opponent at law so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Try to make amends. Here's where you're being a peacemaker too. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. It's another form of forgiveness. You, you want to ask your opponent to forgive you. Don't be hard-headed. Don't be stubborn. Try to make amends. Okay? That's how we're supposed to be living. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you've paid the last cent. You know, it says, it's real tiny, literally, quadrants equaling two mites, for example, like of a daily wage. Oh, you see, in other places, denarius is considered a day's wage. Well, anyway. You won't get out of there until you've paid the last cent. Whatever, however much the opponent says you owe him. All right. Now, verse 27. You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. Again, another one of the Ten Commandments. Some people think that's all the laws they had. No, uh-uh. But he's using them as examples here. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman or a woman at a man with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Or a woman with a man has committed adultery with him in her heart. Don't do it. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Well, we know we're not going to really pluck our eye out, right? So what do you think this means? I would like to hear your comments on it. If you feel like putting one, tell me what you think this means. Because we know it means not really your eyeball. You're not going to cut your eyeball out. People will lock you up for good in the loony bin. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have called it that. In a mental institution. Because that's just not right. Jesus is using, metaphorically speaking, your right eye. All right, how is it that you lust after a woman? Could be you sit in a park, you watch her all day, you watch people all day. You, you watch them for someone. Ooh, well, there's one. And you let your mind wander. That's one way. But how do most people do it? Nowadays, it's on television or computer or a tablet, or a cell phone. So how do you not do it then? If you have to, you throw out your device, or you cut off the TV, you don't allow yourself to even engage in that activity, and turn to your word. That's one way. Y'all feel free to tell me whatever else way you think it means. If your right hand makes you stumble, 
cut it off and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Again, it's metaphorically speaking. I think that's the right word. You don't really cut off your right hand. So what does it mean? What do you think it means? I'd like to hear from you. That's verse 30. It was said, Whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Well, I looked that up. And all a man had to do, if he found her to not be such a good wife, or he found her to be, um, or what was, unchaste, so I guess flirtatious with other men, maybe even sleeping with them, I don't know, it didn't spell that out, but you can look it up. It's in Deuteronomy where it lists the laws, okay? This was a law where a man could write her a writ of divorce. He had to hand it to her. She had to accept it. Well, he handed it to her and sent her on her way. Now, I say to you, verse 32, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. That's if she remarries. And women back then especially, how did women support themselves? Some had a skill, like uh, Lydia, who was the maker of purple. She knew how to make purple dye, and uh, weave fabric and dye it purple. And that made her a living. But not all women had that skill. There weren't a lot of skills for women, but baking... Well, you think about it. It's not a lot. They didn't have vocational schools and colleges for women back then. All right. So, you, all she could do is turn to another man and marry him. And so it's saying, I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. Well, you know, it sounds to me like she's already committed adultery. But, so when you remarry, you remarry a man... It just makes me wonder. I had a friend here who's no longer with us. I'm sure she's in heaven. Pretty sure. Um, she was so worried about her daughter because her daughter was married to a man who had already been married. And she was just, all the time we met, she would just talk about her daughter being married to this man. And, oh, how she needed to divorce him after all these years, you know. She still... So she's still committing adultery if she's still married to him. I don't know. I don't think so if you've repented. What do you think? I'm asking. I believe that if you recognize that it was adultery and you repent of it, the Lord will forgive you. All right. And I did it three times. That's why I don't mind telling you I was an adulterous whore. Some of you are new. You haven't heard me say that. But I was. I thought I had to have a man in my life to be complete. And right after I married the third one, I realized when I saw what exactly who he was. I cried out to the Lord. First, I was mad. And I said, is this who you think I deserved? I prayed. I prayed so hard for you to help me find the right mate. And I was like, it took me just uh, maybe the next day. 
after trying, wanting him to come home. I was so worried about him. He didn't come home. He didn't come home. And I, I was mad. And then I finally, I was like, I had an epiphany. I understand now, Lord. I understand. We don't need another man. You will take care of us better than any man ever could. I tried to make the marriage last anyway. I could not. I had to leave. And now I'm divorced again. And that's exactly how I'll stay. Because I'm married to Jesus already. According to Isaiah 54.5. I believe it is. For your maker is your husband. And anyway. When you're engaged to a man. Back then. And the Hebrew. The Hebrew. Um, custom is once you agree to marry the two agree they are considered husband and wife that's why Joseph had to he was going to secretly put Mary away divorce her when he found out she was with child even though they hadn't had their wedding yet he found out she was with child and then he had the dream, of course, that said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. She is with child from the Holy Spirit. Anyway, moving on. So, when you divorce your spouse, I hope, we're so to the end, so... Surely none of you are planning a wedding for any time soon. If it's your first, neither have been married, go ahead and go for it. But we may not be here for it. Alright. Make sure you love Jesus most. If you love Jesus most, let's say here's the woman, here's the man. You both love Jesus most. You're both loving him most, then your bond, I know this is the Illuminati symbol, but it's also like husband, wife, well, I guess it should be an upside down. Anyway, you're, you're, you're a stronger bond. Okay, let's do it that way. All right. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not make false vows. Now, see, this is not one of the Ten Commandments. Um, all right, you shall not break your vows. Well, okay, if you make false vows, then that means you're going to break them. But shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. It's talking about promising the Lord. Oh, Lord, if you give me a good crop this year, I will give above and beyond my 10%. That's what a tithe is. And that is an Old Testament law. We should all be givers according to how God has blessed us. Okay. He said... You, okay, you were told you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet. Can you imagine? I tried to imagine that the other day. God sitting on the throne and his legs stretching out so far that the earth was his footstool. And I thought, that's some crazy long legs you got there, Lord. I mean, seriously. So is that a metaphor? Is that there's another word I'm trying to think of, and I can't think of it. It's a, gr a grammar word. Uh, I can't think of it. Well, somebody might be saying it right now, whoever's listening. Okay. 
I thought about doing this live, but I'm glad I didn't because all the chatter on the side, the chatting, it's distracting. I don't know why so many people go live, um, especially when you're giving a prophecy. So distracting. Um, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. So don't swear by anything like that. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. Or from the evil one. I swear on my father's grave I am not lying. You see, that's what he's talking about. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I looked that up in my Bible. I got it marked. Uh, that is a law, okay? Um, if someone killed your loved one you were allowed to kill them i mean it was a body a life for a life i think but mostly it pertained to animals if you somehow killed someone's animal you had to give them an animal uh but i'm not sure exactly how it's worded but anyway it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth but i say to you do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. That's hard. Turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt or a garment worn next to this, the body, a tunic, you might have heard it here, heard as a cloak, let him have your coat also, and that is an outer garment, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too, now I learned this from Pastor Mark, he was our, Mark Carell, you can look him up on here, he's got his own YouTube, Mark Carell Ministries, he talks so fast though, so if you like people that talk fast, he's, I don't agree with him on everything, I loved him as my pastor, he was my pastor of the Assemblies of God, and he's very smart, and he didn't even have to go through seminary. He was self-taught by the Holy Spirit, you could say, taught by the Holy Spirit. I think he had to go before the board and answer, do an oral exam, and he passed with flying colors, I'm pretty sure. He said he's very smart. Um, so anyway, he taught us that this is what it means. Back in those days, the Roman soldiers could knock on your door as they were walking down your street to the next town and say one of them was tired of carrying his stuff. They were legally allowed to knock on your door and make you carry their belongings one mile. Now how, how they measured, I don't know. But Jesus is saying, if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Carry his stuff for two miles. Now, nobody does that anymore, obviously. So, what might it mean? Maybe somebody is hitchhiking, and you feel led by the Holy Spirit to pick him up. And the man says, well, I'm going pretty far, but if you could just get me to the next town where I can get something to eat, uh, I would appreciate it, and then I'll get a ride from there. Well, maybe you could pray about it while you're driving him there. And if you can, maybe you can drive him on to the next town. Okay, so you might look at it that way. All right, and maybe y'all can think of some other examples of how we can, 
If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. I'm really anxious to hear y'all's comments about these things. All right, verse 42. This is a long chapter. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now, how many times have I put up a request for somebody that needed money? And yes, prayers are needed. And no, we can't give to everybody. You may have a certain ministry on here that you support. And you give all you can to them. Okay, that's fine. But I just can't help but think that some more people could give could have given five or ten dollars to the cause. You know, when a whole bunch of people pitch in five or ten dollars, it adds up. Okay, so give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now, somewhere in, I believe it's Proverbs, there's a scripture that says, let, let me look it up. File, new tab. Help me not get off track, Lord. Okay. Neither a bar, huh, it turned right up, or a lender B. I want to know where this verse is. The meaning and usage. All right. Um, oh, come on. I want to talk about Hamlet. No, it's in the Bible. This is a famous phrase said by Polonius in Act 1, Scene 3 of Williams. Neither a borrower or a lender beat. No, let's go back. I'm going to put scripture. Surely, with biblical passages that reference lending and borrowing, the Bible must be the origin of the phrase Exodus 22.25. If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you shall not deal with them as a creditor. You shall not exact interest from them. All right. Ah. Proverb for the day. Proverbs 22, 7. Neither a borrower or a lender be. So that falls into Old Testament teaching. Now, which is why some people will, you know, someone said, man, I really need $20. I can pay you back on either this Friday or next Friday. Can you please loan me $20? I need gas for whatever to get back and forth to work this week. And you're like, no, I, I really don't have it, dude. Um, maybe somebody else can help you out. And you got it. You, ha you could help him. But you, or you might say, oh, no, uh, the Bible says neither a a borrower nor a lender be. I've had that thrown up in my face. Anyway, let's move on. If you can, you loan. If you can't afford to give. If you can afford to give, give the money outright. All right. All right, where am I? Now, you have heard that it was said... You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Really? Let me go to tools. Hate your enemy? Where's references? Cross references. All right. Probably. All right. Let's try Deuteronomy. Let's see. Deuteronomy 23.6. All right, I'm going to open a new file, new tab, Deuteronomy 23.6. I don't think I copied it. D-E-U-T, Deuteronomy 23.6. I may have to Google it. There's several references. 
Thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days. No. No, no. And hate. Psalm, Psalm, Psalm. Let's try Deuteronomy 25, 17. Copy. Paste. Go. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt. Nope, it's not it. All right, um, I'm afraid I'm going to get lose track. Ye have heard that it was said, and hate thine enemy. Ooh, now my computer's jumping around. All right, Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner, and he said, The Lord has sworn, The Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. I think those are Nephilim. You shall never seek their peace or their prosperity all your days. Remember what Amalek did to you along the way when you came out from Egypt. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Okay, that's Psalm 139.22. Oh, these are different verses. Do I not hate those who hate you is Psalm 139.21. But you, O Lord, be gracious to raise me up to and raise me up that I may repay them. Is a Repay does not mean pay them back with money. It means to smite them, repay them. What they did to me, let me do to them. Psalm 41.10 Deuteronomy 25.17 Remember what Amalek did to you along the way when you came from Egypt. Deuteronomy 23.6 You shall never seek their peace or their prosperity all your days. They were to hate them. Well, no wonder. they were. Uh, some of them were giants. Okay. So, he says... Oh, man, I went way high up. Okay, let's exit out of that. You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, having said that, I'm sure the Lord meant your enemies as in mankind we do not have to pray for Nephilim or demon filled people not humans who are demonized or oppressed or even possessed those are the people that end up in mental institutions because most people do not know how to recognize a demon possessed person they're hearing voices. They're either being told to kill people or their self. So they're always hurting their self. So they're locked up for the rest of their life when all they need is deliverance. Okay, let me get on because I know this is long. Wow, it's past an hour. Thank you, Lord. Okay, I will feed you in a few minutes, Jasper. He's being so good. He's laying at my feet. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons. Okay, B has show yourselves to be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So, 
we really don't know what is in people's hearts when they do something to us and make fun of us. They may be jealous or want what we have. And instead of asking, how can I have what you have? I want to live like you. I want to have joy like you. They make fun of us and persecute us. The, this next verse, 46, says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Hmm. Gentiles. I'm going, I was going to click on that. Way at the bottom. I want to know if he means everybody but Jews, and I'm pretty sure it does. Um, heathen, heathen man. So, I guess in like for our day and age, you could say that it's the heathen. Not, a, there are no Gentiles now, but back then, the Gentiles were considered heathen anyway, even if they lived a good life. Basically, nice to people. Okay, so it says, adapted to the genius, genius or customs of a people, peculiar to a people, or national. Two, suited to the manners or language of foreigners, strange, foreign. Three, in the New Testament, savoring of the nature, savoring, Okay, of the nature of pagans alien to the worship of the true God, the heathenish. And under that is a capital A of the pagan, the Gentile. Okay, they don't know God, they don't know any better. All right. So they're saying, uh, if you greet only your brothers, Jesus is saying, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now that gets some people, because they know they're not, and they've been trying to be. And like me, I've been a Christian all my life, just about, I was 17. And I started off, not very good, but when I turned 20, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. My life turned around for two years. I was really close to perfect. I quit smoking. I didn't smoke a whole lot before that anyway, so it wasn't hard, but still, I quit smoking. I didn't drink. I mean, if, yeah, I did drink before that. See, even after I was saved, that's when I... Because you can't drink till you're 18. Back then in Ohio, you could drink low beer, what they called low beer. And my boyfriend, who turned out to be my husband, would take me to his favorite little hangout where he could play pool with his buddies and I could drink low beer. Yeah. I never got drunk. Uh, he never bought me more than two, I don't think. But I don't remember ever staggering out of there. But I have been drunk once or twice. I didn't like it. Praise God for that. And I was allergic to marijuana. Thank God for that. Yeah, that was pushed on me too. Anyway, here I am. I'm 65 years old. And I still need more discernment. I still want more wisdom. I still need to have a better mouth. There's a song about, oh, it's from Isaiah, Touch My Coals. Oh, Lord. Uh, and I sing that song and I touch my mouth like this. I want him to take coals and make my mouth where I never uh, say an angry word or a 
complain or uh, gossip or anything. Anything that would grieve the Lord. I should, you know, at some point you'd think we would be perfect. But when in this fleshly body, you know, that hurts and when you lack sleep or you lack food and your belly's so hungry and somebody, maybe you're a driver and somebody pulls out in front of you and you flip them off. You didn't mean to, but you've had a really bad day and what do you do? Oh God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me for that. I am so sorry. If I could find them, I would apologize. That's what you do. And the sin is gone. So you're back to being clean, clean heart. Remember, you let God circumcise your heart. You let your heart stay clean. How do you keep it clean? You repent. You ask forgiveness immediately, as soon as you realize. Now, some things you may be talking with some friends, and it might be two hours later that it hits you. Oh, my gosh, what I said, that was, that was gossip, wasn't it, Lord? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I, I gossiped with those women. You know, something like that. But we're trying. You're trying to put to death the evil deeds of the flesh. You're putting to death the flesh. The more and more perfect you become, the more apt you are to be counted worthy to escape all these things that are to come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21, 36. So now I'm at the end of Matthew 5. I'm going to say I plead the blood of Jesus over this video and let it go up. Ugh. And... I plead the blood of Jesus over each and every one of you and myself, our devices, and our internet connections. And tomorrow I will come back with part two of the Sermon on the Mount so we can stay in the Word and know and be reminded of how we are supposed to be living to prepare for, to be caught up in the first rapture when we go outside of time to get our glorified body, our heavenly armor, and our instructions to come back and help our loved ones and whoever God has for us to heal, bring back from the dead, to feed the multitudes. Who knows? Who knows what he's going to have us to do? I'm sure there's going to be a lot of work, but you know what? We will never get tired, for they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will rise up on wings as eagles. They will run and not get weary, and they shall walk and not faint. That's Isaiah. Okay, I got to tell you now. I should know it. I have it on a bookmark somewhere. I'll find it. All right, come on. For they who wait upon the Lord. You know I always have to add something at the end. All right. For they. Oh, that's it. That's it. This thing must have heard what I was saying. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Okay, so there you go. I love you all. Thank you for your prayers. And... Uh, I, like I said, I'm going to, I hope I can finish up all of the Sermon on the Mount by tomorrow night. Okay, I love you all. Bye for now. I shall talk to you later.